Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Bum, bum, bum. I should, have, I should have gotten with Susan for that because I think she could have done it on the organ a lot more effectively than I do it. But the point is this passage that begins with this ominous foreshadowing. You see, the Israelites have settled in Egypt almost by mistake. The beginning of Exodus follows the saga of Joseph, which you'll remember comprises the last several chapters of Genesis. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. All his brothers are jealous of him, so they sell him as a prisoner, and he ends up in Egypt. They want to get rid of him. He ends up in Egypt, and because he can interpret dreams and because God is with him, he quickly rises above the rank of prisoner and becomes Pharaoh's second in command, Pharaoh's chief advisor. But then when there is a famine in their land, in in the land of Canaan, all of Jacob's family ends up moving to Egypt too, because thanks to Joseph's interpretation of dreams and faithfulness to God, Egypt had been ready for the the famine and has abundant food stored up. And so it is this huge extended immigrant family, Jacob's, all of Jacob's sons and all of their families who move to Egypt as foreigners. But because of their connections to Joseph, they are treated well. And so enter Exodus 1.8. A new king arises who does not know Joseph. He says, to his people, the Egyptians. Look, these Israelite foreigners, they're everywhere. They are so numerous. They are so strong. We got to be smart. We got to get ahead of this problem before they get to be so strong that they could overthrow us. And now, It's pretty hard to believe that the Israelites were actually more numerous than the Egyptians. Given our own context of flamboyant, xenophobic leaders, this feels a little bit like hyperbole. Okay, maybe the Hebrews aren't statistically more numerous than the Egyptians, but for those of us who are old-timers, We remember how it used to be. You used to only see a Hebrew every once in a while, but now you can't even go to the grocery store without running into an entire family of them. And so this Pharaoh institutes policies to put the Israelites in their place. They are forced into slavery. They had them build storage cities. They harassed them and oppressed them. And clearly, this was coming from a place of fear. Without evidence, the Pharaoh just throws out this hypothetical as a scare tactic. Well, if war breaks out, they will surely take our enemy's side and and they will fight against us. And then they will escape from the land. Could the Pharaoh have thought about this any differently? What if the Pharaoh had sought to partner with the Hebrews to get to know them and and understand them? We have no indication or or evidence that, that the Israelites were plotting anything against the Egyptians. And the irony is that by cracking down on them and 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 by making their lives miserable. Pharaoh is basically turning his prediction into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now that they've become slaves, you better believe that if war breaks out, the Israelites are going to side against their oppressors, against the Egyptians. But what if Pharaoh had instead sought to forge a a common, multicultural, Israeli-Egyptian shared 
identity. Perhaps it wouldn't have to have been that way. But instead, Pharaoh operated from a place of fear. Pharaoh let the unknown run wild in his imagination, creating fear and nightmares. But even as the Egyptians oppress the Israelites, they keep multiplying, they keep getting stronger. But Pharaoh again doubles down. He, he summons some Hebrew midwives And by the way, it's actually unclear if the midwives were Egyptian women who were midwives for the Hebrews, as in people that Pharaoh decreed must be present when the Israelites were born in order for the Egyptians to keep tabs on the Israelite population, or if they themselves were Hebrews who were employed as midwives by their own people. The text can be read either way, although scholars do point out that those two names, Shipra and Pua, are Hebrew names. But regardless of the ethnicity or race of the midwives, Pharaoh gives them a lawful order. When you're helping a Hebrew woman give birth, if the newborn is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The famous Old Testament interpreter and scholar Walter Brueggemann, who, by the way, was writing about four decades ago, not any time near the present, he points out that at this juncture of the story, the Pharaoh's fear of the Hebrews and and of the Israelites, and, and as another aside, I'm using those two words interchangeably, Hebrews and Israelites. Israel refers to uh, the name by which they would have self-identified, and Hebrew is kind of a pejorative name, really, that, that has to do with their otherness, that has to do with people being from over there. Walter Brueggemann points out that Pharaoh's fear of them has become so extreme at this point that it's totally irrational. I mean, think about it. He has this source of free labor propping up the Egyptian economy, which he is now about to voluntarily destroy by ordering that all the males be killed. If he gets what he wants, Pharaoh will soon need to find a new way to fulfill his ambitions and his building projects. But of course it is here where God enters the story. It's the first mention and really it's the only explicit function of God in the story. The Pharaoh who is operating out of fear Fear of these foreigners, fear of the other, fear of the unknown, has let his fear fester into hate. And he has sought to use fear of his own power as a motivator, to use fear of enslavement, to use fear of of oppression, and now fear of death to exert power and control. He, as the authority figure, orders the midwives to kill the baby boys, assuming that they will comply if for no other reason than fear of what he would do to them if they didn't. But the midwives disobeyed. The midwives broke the law. 
Because, the text says, who the midwives feared was God. They weren't afraid about what they would have to say to Pharaoh if they disobeyed. They were afraid of what they would have to say to their God if they obeyed Pharaoh. And then what they do say to Pharaoh is so interesting. Pharaoh summons the midwives, no doubt livid that they have disobeyed. And, and I can't claim to know what the midwives' motivation was for saying what they did, but I think it is fair to say that, that if they had decided to righteously own up to their disobedience and, and own up to this act of resistance by telling Pharaoh to his face that, that he was being immoral and that he should fear God instead of the Israelites and, and that that's why they did what they did, they probably would have died. They probably would have been killed and, and replaced by midwives who would have complied with Pharaoh's command. So instead, these God-fearing midwives tell Pharaoh a lie. As scho scholar Carla Suomala points out, they play into the Pharaoh's own prejudicial fear and negative stereotypes that he's per perpetuating about the Israelites, about how they're these scary, subhuman creatures who, who keep multiplying and keep getting stronger. And, and so they say, oh, oh, Pharaoh, you know the Hebrew women, they're, they're just so strong and they're so vigorous that, that they give birth so quickly that, that they don't even need midwives. They're all done before we can even get to them. And so by making this excuse, by telling this lie, they are able to continue their faithful work of unlawful resistance, of disobedience. And of course, from there, the story gets a little more familiar to us. The story is what we've heard about in Sunday school as the baby is laid into the basket, the baby Moses, under careful watch of his sister. And this act of resistance, this, this subversion of the empire's power, even continues up to another Egyptian woman. It even funnels all the way up to Pharaoh's daughter, who knows this baby must be one of the Hebrew babies. And she does not throw it into the Nile, but raises it as her own, knowing that this is a child of God, knowing whom she really has to fear. Now, I haven't drawn any obvious parallels with our own current world or with the events of history, but I think it is uh, important to note that the week coming up, the week beginning tomorrow, our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, has designated as a week of action resisting the sins of racism and white supremacy. You can go to pcusa.org slash week of action. And the purpose of this week is to bear witness to the way that black and brown people are made in God's image and to confess the way the church has contributed to their oppression and to repent of this, this compliance with the uh, lawful but immoral oppression by telling stories like the story of Shipra and Puah 
stories of resistance to unjust policies. During this week of action, Presbyterians will be advocating for new policies, for just policies, like forms of reparations for slavery, for better health care for the poor, and for more compassionate immigration programs. These, these policies, which you'll notice don't really tend to benefit most Presbyterians, don't benefit most of us being members of a denomination who is largely white and largely middle and middle upper class, but who will benefit people of color and the poor. I intentionally focused on this first half of our lectionary passage specifically because it is in the lectionary, and so often do we ignore it. So often do we only tell the story of cute baby Moses who was found in the basket, that we gloss over the way that so much of the narrative of the Bible is told from the perspective of people without power people who are being oppressed, from the Hebrews in Egypt to the Israelites during the time of the judges to the early church being persecuted and and Jesus' time living under empire. It is so important that we rediscover this context of the Bible's witness so that we can be aware of how different our own context is as Christians who live in a nation that is still overwhelmingly Christian, where we see people like us represented in the halls of power. So it, may, it ought to make us uncomfortable. It ought to force us to ask, whom should we fear? Who is really in control here? And at the end of the day, what will we say not to those who obtain earthly power, but to our God when it comes to which rules, which policies, which perspectives we have decided with which to comply and to put forward. I hope that you will participate in the week of action coming up in the next week. If you have more questions, please email me or talk to me or just go to that website so that you too can see how to be involved. And glory be to God the Creator, God the Son, and God our Holy Spirit and Redeemer. Amen.